welcome everyone. My name is Melissa Tui and I am the EdTech Adoption Specialist here at Ozabot. And we also have Cassandra Willer, um, who's on our marketing team joining us. And we're thrilled to um, be um, hosting this webinar to best support everyone that's um, in attendance. Um, it looks like we have quite a few people on. Um, all to hear about STEAM and social distancing. Um, we have some great uh, co-hosts today. Um, we have Kristen Albright and Gilbert Ramirez, and I'll make an introduction and tell you all about them soon. Um, but we did want to start um, with our agenda. What we are going to cover today are our poll questions. Um, we have some poll questions for our audience just to get an idea of what your needs are um, so that Ozabot can better serve you and better um, uh, support you during this time. We know it's been hectic and crazy and many educators have um, just scrambled to try and make things work for their students and we want to support you in your um, teaching and your students learning. Um, so we'll start with that then we'll go on to introducing Kristen and Gilbert and then uh, we'll do a panel discussion and then at the end we will have an audience Q&A which leads me oh I'm sorry um, I will go over how to use the Q&A feature um, in Zoom after we go through the poll questions. So um, with that, you should be seeing um, some poll questions come up in the next, uh, actually right now. Um, if you could go ahead and answer those questions, I believe we have, um, we have, let's see how many, we have six questions that we would like um, for you to answer. And uh, we'll also go over the results just to get a better idea of what your needs are and where um, everyone's at with the social distancing um, and remote learning situation. So I'll give everyone a couple minutes to fill those questions out. I think we can end this one. Perfect. Um, so we're going to go ahead and share the results really quickly. Um, how confident? So they're one at a time. So we'll go. We'll give like them thirty seconds to answer each one, and then we'll share individually. Oh, great. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Um, so now uh, our first question was, how confident are you with distance learning? It looks like uh, our audience is fairly confident. So, um, that that's a good start, right? Uh, we're here to give you more ideas and more best practices. So that's a good start um, for us to learn and grow together. Um, I'll go on to number two. Oh, launch poll. Next poll question, How, has your student, uh, your school begun online instruction with your students? Oh wow, these are really interesting results. Looks like we're, we have about half of the participants that have answered. Great, okay, I'm gonna end the poll now. And our results are that 60% um, of our attendees have started remote learning. So that's, um, we're kind of in that half of half and half range and which is great because Kristen and Gilbert, um, one of them are um, utilizing remote learning and the other is not. So we're going to have a really great um, uh, perspective from both uh, both types of learnings and situations. All right, let's move on to poll question three. How many hours per day are you supposed to engage in direct instruction with your students? So um, if you're in remote learning, um, answer this with how many hours you're directly teaching with your students. If you're not in a remote learning setting, um, think about how much preparation if your district or school is requiring you to prepare um, packets or um, content, how much time your students are spending with those materials. Looks like uh, almost half of us have voted. That's okay. crazy. I see a lot of four plus hours. That's a lot of time that you have to spend per day. That's crazy. I'll share these results. It looks like most people are in the one to two hour range, um, but we do have some that are not um, in, um, engaging in direct instruction with their students and some that are in that higher three four plus hour range. OK, 
Okay, we'll move on to question four. Are you currently an Ozobot user? We're just curious to know how many of you are um, using Ozobots or have used Ozobots and how many are here just to get some ideas about remote learning just to better serve your needs. It looks like we're 72%. Uh, so majority of us are use Ozobot users and some of us are not, but we're gonna um, cover all of uh, a lot of different things for all different types of users. So not to worry if you're not using Ozobot. If you are an Ozobot user, were you able to bring your Ozobots home? So we're just curious to know if you have access um, to, as a teacher to create materials or to um, utilize them somehow. So all right. And it looks like most people, it's about half, but most people were not able to bring the Ozobots back with them. So that's good information for us to know. And our last question, um, if you are an Ozobot user, would you benefit from a webinar about using Ozobots while online teaching? Looks like there's still a few more answers coming in. Thank you all for participating in the poll. And uh, I'm gonna share the results. It looks like a lot of us are interested in utilizing Ozobots to teach um, remotely. So um, that is a note taken by our Ozobot team and we will be able to uh, work on that and get that to you as soon as um, we're able to, to support you. Okay, great. Um, Awesome, thank you for participating in that poll. It gives us insight into what our audience looks like and um, what things are next steps for how we can best support you. Moving on to our next question. Uh-oh, I believe this slide was um, going to cover what the question and answer system will look like. We have turned off the chat just so we can better streamline the question and answer um, for our panelists since this is a panel type of webinar. If you look on your Zoom controls, there is a Q&A feature. Um, we are going to ask that as a audience, if you have questions for our panelists, go ahead and click on that Q&A, type in your question and ask at the end when we have um, Q&A time, we'll, uh, we'll be able to ask both um, Kristen and Gilbert those questions to get you those answers. Okay. Um, oh no, How, I actually am missing the introduction slide um, for Kristen and Gilbert. Let me try this one more time. I apologize for the delay. Let's see if this works. It's not loading, but it is in my little screen. So let me try this one more time. Sorry about the delay. So we'll just do this on the small screen for some reason. It's not allowing me to share it in presentation mode. So um, we have both Kristen Albright and Gilbert Ramirez with us today. Kristen is an incredible educator. She's also a Ozbot certified educator. Um, she is in Pennsylvania. She's national board certified. Um, she was STEM teacher of the year um, uh, for her region, I believe. And um, she won some really great awards such as the Pennsylvania um, Board Association's uh, Innovative Teacher Award. We're thrilled to have her. Um, and I'll let her tell a little bit more about herself really quickly. Um, Kristen, would you like to kind of uh, talk about what the situation is for your students in your district and your school currently? Sure. Um, we are located right outside of Penn State University. We are um, in the central Pennsylvania, so we're, we're pretty rural. Um, we are one-to-one -one with Chromebooks, but what we found was, and this is going to be a question coming up, so I might uh, repeat myself a little bit here, but um, we were on spring break when the shutdown happened. So a lot of our materials were of course in the buildings that are now shut down. So that has been one of our biggest challenges, figuring out how to get um, our kindergarten through fifth grade don't take the Chromebooks home. 
to figure out how to get those devices into the hands of children has been a major um, issue. I teach uh, K to five STEM, so I am a special, um, but we are trying as specialists to do as much as we can to support the regular classroom teachers right now. Um, we're also offering some choices for children to do um, STEM activities unplugged at home or plugged at home. Um, so we're kind of offering a variety of services at this time. I find that we all kind of pitch in together and um, it's kind of exciting to see where we're taking things with some of the challenges we're offering students, some of the challenges we have for ourselves as teachers, and then um, just how we are trying to make it as normal for kids as we can in this very unnormal situation has been uh, our biggest uh, challenge, and I'm sure it is for all of you too. Thanks so much, Kristen. I think that helps paint the context. Um, and I'm sure there's many um, attendees that are in similar situations as you and your students and your staff. Um, we also have Gilbert Ramirez with us, who um, he's a mathematics instructional co coach, a WASP coordinator um, at Hawthorne High School um, in Sentinel Valley Unified School District here in Los Angeles, California. And he's also part of um, UCLA's educational leadership program pursuing his doctoral um, degree. So Gilbert, um, would, you, would you like to add anything to what your uh, situation looks like for your students and your staff? And you're um, on mute, by the way, yes. <laughs> hey. uh, sure, absolutely. Um, is the video coming in on your end? I don't see it. Okay, let me click the pause video and then I'll start video again and see if it'll, hopefully it'll. There we go. Nice. There we go. Okay. Uh, well, first off, let me just say it's an honor to be um, a part of this with you all. Um, fairly similar to uh, what we're talking about just in general. Um, at Sentinella, we have a one-to-one -one Chromebook to student ratio, which we're really happy that we were able to do. But it's not easy. It's, it's a process to get everyone on board. Um, teachers right now are in the process of trying to get their lesson plans um, up and running on Canvas, our learning management system. Um, they're really trying hard to get all students to just be part of this process. And, and it's, it's definitely a challenge, um, uh, even though we have the ability to pivot um, with our technology use in our district. Um, we're trying to get everyone to do uh, synchronous and asynchronous um, instruction with which I can get into a little bit later and then there's the component of being a coach and still supporting my teachers even though that uh, I'm not able to uh, physically visit their classroom we're quickly building a system uh, where I can visit them online and uh, observe them in their uh, synchronous instruction uh, but we've rolled out in the last week over I want to say over 15 different um, strategies, um, to say the least, and processes. So we'll talk about that later, but I'm just really excited to be with you all. And we're in this together. It's not an easy process, but um, sharing like this, I think, is, is the right thing to do right now. Thank you so much, Gilbert. Cool. So we're going to jump right into, um, oh, here we go. Now the slide's deciding to work. So here are their beautiful faces. Again, we're thrilled to um, have Kristen and Gilbert here. They're incredible educators and um, just have so much knowledge to share with all of us. So thank you both for attending. Um, so again, Q&A, if you have any questions for Kristen and Gilbert, we will um, follow up with um, audience questions at the end. So use that Q&A feature. Um, Great, we'll jump right into questions. Um, what's the biggest challenge your school and district has faced and how has this been addressed? I can start. Um, as I had said, we were on our um, spring break. So uh, we actually had to go reach out to all the parents in the district and figure out what devices they had in their home, um, trying to communicate that with um, English language learners has been really tricky just because um, of the additional language barrier. Some of the parents and children are still not home from wherever they're on break. Some of them are quarantined in different places. So trying to figure out if those people have devices and also trying to figure out how to approach um, fair and appropriate public education has been a challenge here in Pennsylvania and I'm sure across um, the country when we're looking at, at how to provide this for students with disabilities and students with IEPs. And uh, there's a lot of different challenges that we're facing right now. So we actually had the school nurses um, 
having curbside pickup with gloves and masks on, putting Chromebooks in trunks of people's cars. Uh, they had a, a parade of people in the school bus lines, and that's been um, something that we never thought we would have to do. Um, another challenge our district is facing is feeding the children, which is another huge, huge problem that I'm certain we can't address here, but we've had lots of local restaurants and businesses um, offering to feed children who are not able to get their um, free and reduced lunches at the school. Um, we have schools handing out lunches and we're pulling people from all different um, backgrounds. Teachers are helping, nurses are helping, counselors are helping. Um, to try to make sure that the kids have the services they need is probably the biggest challenge that our school district is facing right now. Thank you, Kristen. Um, Gilbert, do you have any thoughts about this question? Absolutely. So I would say uh, the biggest challenge that our school district is currently facing is, again, what was just mentioned, is with, uh, just making sure that all students are able to access their classes online, make sure that they're able to download materials um, is really a challenge for us um, at our school district. I mean, so far it's been going well. Uh, we have uh, been making calls to students, reminding them that their assignments continue on Canvas, Canvas which is our uh, learning management system, but we don't know exactly how many students are not able to access uh, their materials or simply are not willing to access their materials simply because this is brand new for them and we're teaching high school students and um, this is a disruption in their routine and so when we see that with with any age group uh, particularly with high school students we see a proclivity towards just kind of falling wayward and so we're aware of that and we're um, I'm part of a task force that's been calling students daily and saying oh, look your, your assignments continue online uh, it's imperative that you uh, continue to do your assignments and 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 submit those. Um, but I would say the biggest um, challenge would be equity. Uh, just making sure that all students can access the materials. Again, uh, we have a population of IEP uh, special needs students. Uh, we have um, ELLs or second language learners, and so we're trying to really differentiate for them as well. Um, that's a challenge. Um, and again, we also have parents that are working. Um, and have had their working lives uh, disrupted. And so we know that students, this may not be uh, the number one thing, although as educators, we believe it should, it, it may not be the number one thing on their mind um, at the time. And so we, we wanna honor that as well. So um, those are some of the biggest challenges that I can think of uh, right now. And along with that, Gilbert, something that I know I've heard a lot as well is even if students have access to technology and um, internet and whatnot, having that environment and safe place to learn or quiet and focused space is not available to these students because like you said, parents are at home working remotely or their siblings or other things that are getting in the way of um, deep, meaningful learning. And so that's a challenge that students have faced as well. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, what measures have been taken to ensure equitable educational practices? I know that you both have touched on this, but I would love to hear um, how you, you or your district is thinking about um, promoting equity and what next steps, um, you know, just sharing ideas of what that looks like to both of you. It's very different in the elementary than the secondary level, I think. I think it's kind of great that we have um, different experiences here to share. Um, what we found is it's most important to give children choices um, when it comes to um, performing a task, whatever the end learning goal is, we want to be able to give them choices about how they get there. Um, because as Gilbert had said, their educational systems or systems at home are so different. We're not sure if they're trying to share a device with three other siblings at the same time. Um, so definitely having that asynchronous option is, is important. Um, with reading, writing, we're focusing in our district right now just on reading, writing, and math. Just those three embedding other subjects in, uh, in terms of content with um, nonfiction stories, for example. But everything is focused on just reading, writing, and math. And teachers, especially at the early elementary levels, are doing choice boards. Because we don't even know at this point what students have in their homes. Do they have paper? Do they have markers? Uh, and when we're thinking about equity, a team of specialists, we all got together um, in library art 
um, STEM, and we, we got together and decided to make a big choice board with other options. We wanted to make sure it was all fair for students to be able to all be able to do it by themselves. Uh, because we don't know what how much parental support they would have. Um, we also wanted to be really cautious about the materials that we were requiring for different challenges. Um, we were talking, for example, about for the M in STEM, doing one where students measure their bed using um, non-standard measurement units and then um, graphing that out. Well, we talked about maybe students don't have a bed. We don't know what their homes look like. So every single challenge on and around thinking about how we can make sure that every student can access that information every student would have similar materials and i think what we found is leaving it up to choice and really making them open-ended um, in stem we're very big on notice and wonder and journaling where they're just looking at regular everyday phenomenon how their sink works or um, how far a air paper airplane can fly all of those different things, getting outside and taking a walk. So with the really young students, we're focusing just on those notice and wonders and really making sure that the challenges that we're giving have the materials that anyone could find in their home, like water, not things like um, Legos, because not a lot of students, we don't know exactly what they have in their home, whether Legos or other things. So we had them um, designing something from materials they found outside. Um, it would certainly look different for every student, but it was all something that they can access. So being fair and equitable that way. Also using our support people, um, our English language um, teachers and our special ed teachers and our interventionists, making sure that before we send something out, making sure it's something that their students can access. So it can be certainly with the gifted instructors, we talk about how we could make it accelerated and how anything that we submit to for students to hand in would have to be um, accessible for students who have reading disabilities. So we want to make sure that we're equitable across the board and as taking it as a team approach, all of us putting our eyes on, on the materials before we send them out has really allowed us to think about how um, as a team we can make it fair for everyone. Thanks so much, Kristen. Uh, Gilbert, how has your school and district um, been uh, promoting equity during this challenging time? Right, so as Kristen mentioned, uh, it's a complex system, right? It's a complex issue. Um, we in education are already aware that there are inequities that inherently exist to access. Um, and so in, in Los Angeles, that's very clear. Um, in our district, uh, there are those that have um, more than others. And so when we started this process of uh, distance learning, we were very clear that we had our our work cut out for us. And so what we did is we went ahead and um, I would say the main thing is communicated to every single student, every single parent uh, via phone call, email, um, and FaceTime and Zooming, um, the expectations for learning that the classes continue, assignments are online. Uh, we also communicated with every single teacher, every single TOSA, teacher on a special assignment like myself, every single administrator, and we broke apart our entire district into uh, various sectors. And we went ahead and assigned teams to literally, and I'm one of those teams, to call students daily um, to make sure they're logging in, to make sure they're in, uh, submitting their assignments, that they know how to submit their assignment. If they have internet access, um, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be bilingual. So I've been working with um, our Spanish speaking parents and um, several of us in the district obviously are ASL teachers, bilingual, and so we're able to access um, you know, our, our, our multicultural populations. And so it's extremely important, I believe, that communication, constant communication is there. Um, that being said, the counterpoint is this, um, not everyone has internet access. Uh, not everyone has a computer that's either functional or a sibling that has their own computer, like Kristen said, so we have a situation where they may be sharing computers. Um, one of my students uh, said, Mr. Ramirez, what if I don't have a quiet space in my uh, small apartment to do the work? And so whereas she is uh, at the poverty level, and then maybe one of our other students, because it's very diverse where we teach, is uh, in a more affluent situation, 
there's a disparity there. Whereas in the physical classroom, we have physical space for all students. That may not be the case at home. And so um, we're doing everything we can. Um, again, the takeaway from this is communication is very important. Communicate to students and teachers and parents the expectation that assignments continue, but there is uh, wiggle room. There is flexibility. There has to be a differentiated understanding that all, not all students are having equal access to internet and computers right now. And so uh, with that understanding, we cautiously move forward. But again, I think um, the main point there is just ensuring that we have an understanding that not all students have access to technology. And the next phase is then what do we do about that? And I think that's um, where we're at now is doing those follow-up calls, uh, making sure that those Chromebooks are being passed out. I know Kristen mentioned that they had this long line. Um, we did the same as our, at our school district and we've also been visiting homes, dropping off uh, laptops, making sure that they have access to that information. Great, thank you, Bo. Um, what's the biggest challenge your students face and how have you supported them? I know you both have touched a lot about that, but if there's anything else that um, you want to include, um, this would be a great time or we can move on to the next question. I'd like to address, I was thinking about these questions, um, you know, prior to, to this webinar. And I think the biggest thing that students are facing right now is fear. There's so much uncertainty. And our job as teachers is not only to provide instruction, but also to provide some sense of normalcy. Um, we have Zoom meetings and every specialist, every interventionist, every principal, every teacher has been making their, um, every teacher, I guess I should rephrase this, every teacher has been having um, set uh, Zoom meeting times where they're doing their typical morning meetings. Um, some teachers are even doing the pledge and their normal greetings that they do every morning to try to keep it as normal as possible. But just being able to see our faces, know that we're okay, seeing their classmates' faces, getting to visit with their classmate's dog or hamster or whatever they're shoving up into the, the camera is what we've been noticing a lot this week. Um, it's a lot been of, of, of show and tell, but you know, it, it seems like it's not productive time, but it is because you're building that foundation for this new normal where they're learning the norms for how, in, how to uh, use Zoom. They're learning how to communicate in a different way and then they're taking these and, and finding their own way to, um, one kindergarten student asked her mom if she could have a um, Zoom lunch chat, they put up this lunch chat and invited a kindergarten teacher who was completely surprised, but they all sat and had lunch together. And just these little moments allow students to have that normalcy, to see that things are okay, that their teacher's okay, that the class pet is okay. And it seems so silly to think about those kinds of things, but that's the most important thing on, on little students' mind is that everyone's okay. So having that challenge of being able to reassure, reassure the students has been huge. I appreciate that you brought up that point so much, um, Kristen, because we do often forget in this chaos that the so social emotional learning of students is so important. And I love that you said it's not necessarily productive, but it's important, right? We have to be there for our students and that's our number one um, priority as educators. And I, you just stated that so beautifully. Thank you so much for that. Um, Gilbert, what are your thoughts about um, challenges that your students face? Sure. Um... Well, one of the biggest challenges that I've seen as a, as a teacher and as a coach uh, this week is engagement. Um, when I did my first uh, Zoom meeting with my students, uh, I think I had about uh, 25 out of the 30 students. The subsequent meeting uh, was 20 out of the 30. And then most recently, uh, the numbers are continuously dropping. And so one of the things that we're worried about is that students think that uh, this is an extended vacation or this is just not um, uh, you know, going to be documented, uh, recorded, or evidence-based learning, that this is just something that's optional. And, and we're making it clear to students that uh, it is not optional. You must attend these um, synchronous or asynchronous classes when and if possible. And so we're, again, going back to that equity issue of we understand that students may not have equity across the board, and we're certainly addressing that, but we also understand that there are some instances where students are choosing to opt out. And we've seen this in our classes just regularly 
in our normal instruction when we have uh, a, a normal four, you know, four wall classroom and we see students kind of checking out as instructors we step in and say okay what's going on let's get back on track we don't necessarily have that option now a student can simply choose you know what i don't feel like attending class online i'm just not going to and who's going to do anything about it my teachers are in a different situation right now my parents are worried about uh, their work situation and so it gives it gives the unfortunate opportunity for students who are already opting out of their system to continue opting out and so one of the things that i'm doing is um, doubling up those efforts with the phone calls uh, making sure my emails go out i'm also um, digging into alternate numbers that we have for the students so i've called actually a couple of aunties and uncles um, and cousins and they've been able to forward me new information and i eventually get back to the student and say hey did you know this was online and they're like yes i did but you know i i woke up late or i wasn't able to um, get online and so through those conversations again i'm a big believer in communication um, we can we can solve uh, some of those situations yeah thank you both so much um what tools do you find the most helpful for remote te uh, teaching in elementary land we like to use the tools that the students are already familiar with um, so we chose two different platforms for um, handing out information and getting back information. Our K-2 students don't have individual email accounts that they can email anybody but the teacher. Um, so that's been a little bit tricky. Um, but we decided to use Seesaw for K-2. Um, and then grades three to five is um, Google Classroom. And we kicked around a lot of, of different things, um, but all of the grades across are using Zoom. There are so many tools out there and there are so many great opportunities. A lot of companies are offering their products at a discount. Um, so we wanted to try this and all these other different things and adding in other, um, other choices. But then we, we started thinking, what are students most familiar with? What can they use with, on their own independently? And for, for our choices, it was K to two for Seesaw and then three to five with Google Classroom. And we found that that was pretty productive. Um, we're also going to be using um, Flipgrid for some asynchronous activities, uh, Zoom for the live meetings and um, trying to um, stay in touch with parents via email. Great, thank you. Gilbert, um, what tools are helpful for your students in the high school setting? Sure, uh, there's several tools that we're currently using. Um, if I may, I'd like to share my screen, if I can uh, showcase some of those uh, with you. And one of the main tools that um, you'll see here is just taking a look at our Canvas um, interface. So with CV, Sentinella Valley uh, Union High School District, we've uh, been doing uh, Canvas online learning management as well as in-class learning uh, together and so we have this uh, sort of combo deal where you go to class physically and you also attend uh, you know your sessions online if the teacher is assigning an extra work or um, learning or follow-up activities not all teachers are required to use this during our regular uh, previous lives and when we were teaching uh, in brick and mortar, but now with online distance learning, uh, it's become uh, a very good tool for all of us to get on board. And, and what I mean by that is previously, I would say about 80% of teachers were doing this consistently. Now we're uh, very much closer to 100%. And so the two options we have right now are synchronous, asynchronous, um, online at the same time, not online where students can kind of uh, dig in and uh, go through their work uh on their own time uh, these are some of the expectations that our district rolled out uh, where we had asynchronous one 40-minute lesson to 90-minute lessons per our weekly schedule um, we had student drop-ins and a minimum of one hour per day of a uh, office hours uh, that we can have with students so we would communicate that as well um, we had canvas based uh, lessons we were required to have the instructional minimums of a daily agenda, a learning target, an engagement, and assignments. Um, I created a distance learning hub 
uh, for my district. Um, I'd be willing to share these resources anytime with you all. Um, everything from distance learning in Canvas, uh, there's learning templates. Uh, we use Desmos, which is an online uh, interface for math, but it can be used in multiple ways. Uh, we have Illuminate, which is testing. Um, this is a one-stop shop that I created for something other. Uh, Google Meet, of course, uh, Pear Deck, Kahoot, Turnitin, Screencastify, which is great. Um, and these were resources that were central to our district if they needed help. Uh, we have an online help desk. And so these are some of the ways that we've been communicating with our staff um, regarding the expectations. Here's a template where we have our learning objective uh, given our uh, unit or condition, students will, level of cognition, and the standard, as well as the proven behavior of how they will demonstrate their learning. Um, and a sample agenda with constant check for understandings. Uh, with the added on slides, we also um, added on Nearpod, which is a great uh, check for understanding tool, as well as Pear Deck. And again, I'd be willing to spend some time afterwards with anyone that um, would like to get more information on that. So a lot of resources, a lot of information uh, right there. Thank you, Gilbert. Um, I'm gonna switch back over to our slide deck and actually most of the we move on just while we're on that topic we have a question for Kristen um, about using seesaw for k-2 she's wondering if that was difficult to navigate um, she's heard some things that they wouldn't want to use with their students but now she's thinking of adding it so what do, what is your experience then with it oh we really love seesaw we use it quite a bit um, just in our previous life before, I don't know what we call that, before the pandemic and after the pandemic, before COVID, after COVID, I'm not sure what the delineation is, but um, we had a lot of teachers using that. Um, we made it mandatory. So all the teachers now K-2 have to use it, even if they weren't uh, planning on using it. Um, now they're strongly encouraged, I guess is the, the words that are coming out of um, administration, but they're strongly encouraged to use um, K K to two with the C. So we we really love it in the fact that it's very user friendly um, because we have students who come up through our same building. A lot of the students who are a little bit older in third and fourth and fifth grade um, have seen it in K to two, so they know a little familiarity with it. Our tech department and our tech coaches have been wonderful in providing. Um, video tutorials on how to use it for both teachers and for students. We didn't jump right into this. We took a week to really think about and carefully plan out the tools and how to use those tools. So um, the tech coaches offered um, individual instruction time um, via different sessions that they had going. They had some asynchronous things as well um, through Nearpods and other things to explain how Seesaw works. And it's really been successful so far. And, and um, I had a chance to see um, a teacher using it in her Zoom morning meeting. She highlighted some, she took screenshots of some of the best writing um, that she had seen from an assignment that she had students um, perform. They did, um, it was a doodle. And it was basically, I'm mapping it up, you can tell them elementary, um, a wave shape. And the kids had to decide what they were gonna turn that doodle into and then um, make a, um, a, a writing assignment on that. And then she was able to screenshot the different ones that she really wanted to highlight. And students were so proud to be able to read their work um, in that Zoom meeting. So yes, I think it's a very appropriate tool. Um, because of licensing, we only went K to two with that um, for, for pricing uh, down the road. Um, and three to five had already been using um, Google Classroom, so that's why we chose that. But I, I definitely feel it's worth the effort to get to know that platform because once you get it, it's pretty um, pretty intuitive. Awesome, thank you. And Gilbert, we have a lot of people asking for your slides and resources as well. So we'll, we'll uh, figure out how to get that to you all. Yeah, um, we'll be sure to make sure that we're able to share those uh, materials. Um, Gilbert, if you're all right with sharing those with our audience. Absolutely. I just uh, send my email address along in the Q&A. Please contact me anytime. I'd be happy to share those resources anytime. 
Thank you, Gilbert. Um, I know um, we have about 20 minutes left, so I do want to um, ask a few, um, maybe one or two more of our um, planned questions and then take some from Q&A because I know the audience has a lot of really good questions. So um, what tips do you have for educators who are not comfortable with remote teaching? Um, do either of you have any thoughts about um, tips and tricks? What we decided um, to share with students, or I mean with, with teachers is that, um, they're not looking for perfection. If your dog pops in, um, I actually had my dog Dewey pop in during one of the Zoom sessions and seeing a whole group of second graders eyes get giant and the big smiles on their faces uh, was worth the whole thing. Um, so don't expect perfection. Um, this is happening. So it's, I always say, and it's kind of, uh, kind of a harsh statement, but it's not about you. Um, so you, you, we're just going to have to try to navigate this new way of learning and it's going to be okay. Um, some of our teachers who were very reluctant reached out to other teachers in, in the building and practiced a Zoom session and a seesaw lesson with um, the teacher's children and with the teacher sitting in on the other side, which was really, really helpful. Um, so they could feel very comfortable with it. They started with small things and it doesn't have to be perfect and it doesn't have to be something spectacular that you're rolling out. One of the best ones I saw today was just a teacher talking with her students. She had everybody in the Zoom grid view draw a picture of somebody in the Zoom grid view and then they had to guess who it was. It was a very simple activity, but it got everybody involved because as Gilbert had said, we want to have them keep coming back. So what's that hook that we're going to get them to do? Uh, this teacher then said, I see someone's wearing a crazy hat. I think tomorrow should be crazy hat day. Show up tomorrow with your crazy hats on. And so it's just little things, these little tricks that we already know that we don't know how to do in remote learning that we're already doing in our classrooms. And so just being yourself and encouraging those kids the way that you know how to do it, it's gonna be fine. Thanks so much, Kristen. Uh, Gilbert, do you have any thoughts around um, tips for educators that might not be as comfortable teaching remotely? I'm, sure, absolutely. And I've, I've encountered several colleagues that have told me, you know, um, I'm, I'm really concerned about jumping online and I, this is new to me. And my best uh, tip for them and for all of you is uh, simply to be very forgiving of yourself. Um, you're going to make mistakes. It's a, a new process. And what a wonderful opportunity to model uh, perseverance uh, and also model that we are lifelong learners along with our students. And so we can turn this and spin this in, in that we, like our students, are um, expanding our toolkit. And we're also lifelong learners. We're lifelong students. And so um, that usually calms people down and says, OK, it's, it's OK to make a mistake. It's OK to um, not be perfect in our execution. This is all a brand new process. and so. My biggest advice is to jump in, um, be prepared. There'll be some tech issues here and there, um, but the, the, look, the interfaces online are really extraordinary. I have to say Zoom, Google Meet have done a very good job of um, making it very streamlined. And so um, typically I've seen once that people get on board, they're actually quite impressed with, with a lot of the, um, the interfaces. So jump in, it'll be, it'll be all right. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm actually going to fast forward to our Q&A from our audience because we have some really, really great questions um, from them. Um, so uh, Sophia, um, Sophia has a question for, um, she has a few different questions, but um, she's asking about a simulator of Ozobot that we can use at home. We actually have a webinar scheduled for next Friday. If you check out our webinar page, um, we're gonna do a weekly webinar um, going over Shape Tracer 1, Shape Tracer 2, and then Ozotown. Um, I will be leading those. The first one will be um, all about Shape Tracer 1. That's gonna be for teachers, training teachers on how to teach it remotely. That's next Friday. Um, so visit our webinar page if you're interested in that. And she also has a question for, Chris, uh, for Kristen. Um, where can she find the challenges, the unplugged challenges um, that you mentioned at the beginning of the webinar? Is that something that you're sharing through Twitter or is there a way that um, you'd be able to share those materials? Um, yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, if you follow me on Twitter, um, it's Albright Teacher. 
and I'd be happy to uh, connect with anyone after this. Um, but basically, we're just kind of making it up as we go along, um, thinking about what we did was we drilled down our um, engineering units and we focused on, and I wrote them down because I didn't want to forget them, um, tech adventures, which would be something that would be coding online with the different coding platforms that they use. And then um, STEM explorations, which is going outside and doing those notice and wonders. Um, Maker Lab, we called it, is one of our, our choices. Maker Lab, which is the designing and building from things that they would have in their homes or outside. Um, a video investigation, where students are um, um, watching a video and then answering a series of questions about that. And then our math connection, which is all things that they can do um, in their homes, like um, math problems with their heartbeat or number of steps to the mailbox. Um, we looked at, at um, Teachers Pay Teachers has a ton of choice menus for STEM. Um, we took pieces of different parts of that. Um, you know, teachers are great scavengers. We can find different parts and pieces and put them together. Um, and that's what we kind of did. But then we thought about the environment that our students are in. Um, we live in a college town, so there's a lot of opportunity for them to get out and walk um, to find different things. Um, you know, even the art teacher is having a sidewalk chalk contest right now in front of the school. Everybody has different squares in front of the school that they're going to be um, designing some sidewalk chalk um, things because there's a large, large, large area in front of the school with lots of um, sidewalks. So it's just basically knowing your students and having a pretty good idea of what um, they have in their home and then designing challenges around that. And then going by your curriculum, drilling down to what the two or three most important things you want them to know between now and the end of the year and trying to hit those. Great, thank you. Um, Jeff has a question. Um, he is in an iPad only school and they're still waiting from the Colorado um, Department of Ed for guidance. Um, so his question was, what is everyone doing um, for K through 12 currently? And I know that you've mentioned some activities and some ideas, Kristen, but um, are there any iPad specific recommendations that you might have? Oh, I wish we had iPads because there's so many cool things you can do. I would do something with green screening, have the kids have an adventure that's somewhere not in, in their school um, and try to take them out and about. Um, so many great read aloud applications. Epic, of course, is free. Um, I was going to mention the two that you had said, the Shape Tracer and the Ozotown, which I think would really be intriguing when we get um, Next week, our district is starting with um, mandatory things that are going to be graded. This week has all been just kind of get to know you activities. But um, I want to do some things with debugging um, that would be great with those particular examples. Um, just having them take, take video, that's one of the handiest things about iPads is that they can videotape themselves um, in a variety of different settings and have them um, explain what's happening, a how-to video. Um, there are so many different things. And then the coding apps, um, Scratch and Scratch Junior, um, Code.org has some wonderful activities. Um, these are all things that we're planning on incorporating with our Chromebooks as well. But I, I think the, the um, additional feature with the iPads, it's so much easier to, to run around and videotape. And kids really wanna see what other kids' environments look like. So I think you could have some really rich um, reading and writing around that, even math, around those kinds of things having them make um, stop motion videos. Um, you know, the art teachers right now are having students gather and make their own color wheel with what's in their home. So I think those are really great opportunities. Just with the camera, with the iPad, you can do tons of things that are still academic, not just time filling. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, we have a question from Laura. Um, her question is, are teachers designing authentic learning events? Or are they resorting um, to just survival mode? And I think Gilbert, um, you touched on this a little bit, but we would love to hear more about um, how um, your teachers are creating authentic learning environments and um, assignments for your students. And Kristen as well, if you have any thoughts about that. Sure, one of the things that our teachers are doing is, um, if I go ahead and share my screen again, if, if that's all right. Um, one of the cool things that I've seen uh, is definitely creating um, opportunities for students to um, go through uh, presentations, check their understanding. Uh, there's resources that we've made available to our students, uh, such as the EdTech resources, which uh, will really connect uh, presentations to um, real world 
um, learning opportunities, real world, uh, you know, checking for understanding that connects to their, not just their learning, but ways that they can see it happen in their community. So um, we're using a lot of uh, Google Meet to start meetings with students to have those check-ins, but to also have them showcase videos of, of what, for example, in our science classes, what it is about a certain hypothesis that they're going to investigate, um, what is the process for their own learning? Uh, what kind of um, resources will they um, engage in or make use of? Um, it's another way for them to present their findings. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to walk you guys through is just um, some of the optional enhancements that our uh, distance learning team has made. We want to also make it fun. Um, one of the cool things that we do is Screencastify. So uh, if I go back to my distance learning hub, um, Screencastify, a lot of our teachers will uh, record their notes, record their findings or their projects or just themselves and adding a prompt uh, to the Screencastify uh, video that they create. Um, it's fairly cool to see the teachers and students um, interact with those videos. It's a lot of fun. Um, but also we have um, our exit slips that are continuing. So if I go to courses, and uh, if you take a look at some of the coursework that uh, we're doing, we have a section here on quizzes. Uh, this was one of my uh, previous classes that had already closed. So we'll have quizzes or uh, Flipgrid, um, just a lot of resources. I'm gonna see if I can get you to my current class uh, that I've been working with very quickly. And so for Canvas, let's see if I can go to my hub here. So for Canvas, um, great opportunities to do exit slips and uh, let's see here. If I go back to my Hawthorne High School hub. Yeah, there'll be a lot of opportunities for students to access the digital books here. This is what I wanted to show you guys. So if you have this option at your district, um, a lot of us have gone digital with our textbooks um, and with our instructional support, there's access, it's not loading right now. Oh, here we go. So we've created uh, digital learning uh, textbooks, uh, links, and combined resources. And so through Canvas, everything from AP Bio. And I understand that some of you are um, teaching uh, elementary and middle school, but the concept still is very similar where you have these online um, platforms that students can uh, demonstrate their own learning. Uh, one of the cool things that I've seen is um, students go online and access their own help center and then report on how they were able to correct their own tech issue or check their own understanding um, and really practice that self-advocacy. So. Right now, I think self-advocacy is going to be the number one thing that students will um, have to activate, and I've seen students do that, so it's it's very exciting. So thank you. Thanks. I, Thank I, you. I, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Am I echoing for everyone else? No. Okay. I really like this question from Jeff, and I know that in our poll we had a lot of people who are not doing direct in, direct instruction with students yet. So wondering if you guys have any advice. He says, I'm a full-time STEAM teacher, sees K to five every day. Um, we're also an iPad only school. I'm waiting for guidance on the Colorado Department of Education. What's everyone doing for K to five currently? So Kristen, have you, have you started doing uh, formal instruction yet? No, uh, actually that's where we're meeting and talking about next week, which I, I saw Jeff's question as well, and I'm glad that you pointed that one out. I think it's a, an important one that a lot of us are discussing. Right now the teachers, as I said, are informally trying to in just get students excited about these, learning how to use the tech tools. And then we've talked about how, um, as specialists, we're going to provide our challenges and then collect work from students. Um, certainly being able to use Seesaw and Google Classroom are important and students know how to use that with um, the specialists as well. But we had talked about having specialist office hours um, where um, we would just have an open Zoom time where t kids can pop in. Their biggest thing right now for the elementary level is that they wanna show us what they've been making. 
if they made something from what they found outside. I've been getting a lot of emails, which is wonderful, but we need to be able to in some sort of way. Um, we use a lot of online tools like GimKit and um, Nearpod that we could have asynchronous um, activities where students can then draw or make something that comes back to us. Um, what we're finding is it's, it's hard to find time because if students are sharing devices, they have to have their regular classroom teacher for about an hour a day. Mom and dad probably need the computer for more than that. So how can we make something that doesn't require specific online time, but we are still getting and collecting work? Um, we had also talked about doing challenges once a week and having students use Flipgrid to post their results of those challenges. We use the engineering design process, ask, imagine, plan, create, and improve, um, and having the students work through that and then explain their thinking. That's always what we're looking for anyway is an explanation of why they created what they did. So when they do that and post it on Flipgrid, students can watch each other's and then comment on it. And there's a way that you can use emojis on it if students aren't comfortable with their faces being shown or if they're not allowed to have their faces being shown because that's another big thing with this privacy law um with probably we're not we're still waiting through that and trying to figure out how to make sure students are staying safe online um i saw some people asking about the difference between um zoom and uh, google meet from what i've gathered what we've discussed it's six of one half dozen and another you're going to find benefits and drawbacks to both but just pick a platform and stick with it and make it consistent across the board. Um, both of them have drawbacks and both of them have some really great pluses. Um, but making sure that students can see you and be able to communicate with you is the most important part. Um, you know, when we did our specialist choice board, each of us put five um, spots on a choice board and uh, we're collecting our information from the students in a different way. I want to use a flip grid, like I said, and students can videotape themselves um, explaining it. Or if they're not comfortable with that, they can always email it to me as well. But that way I'm still in the game and still getting them excited about engineering, but not taking away from that valuable computer time, that valuable family time um, that, uh, you know, we don't know what their home situation's like. So we want to make it as easy as possible for them to, co to communicate with us uh, as painless as possible for the parents and make it sure it's something that the students can do alone. Make sure it's focused on your standards so it's not just an activity. Um, and uh, really drill down to what you want them to be able, uh, as we said, the engineering design process is, is at the foremost of everything that we're doing. Thank you so much, Kristen. So we have a couple minutes left. I do want to answer a few questions from the audience. Um, some are asking if this recording will be available to share with other educators. Um, I believe tomorrow, if you are in attendance or if you registered for this webinar, you will get a recording of this sent to you so that you can um, share this with anyone that would benefit from it. We also have a 4 p.m. Um, Pacific time webinar this afternoon. Um, we're going to answer a lot of the same questions. Um, we have Kristen joining us again and then Abby Bash um, from the Buckley School this afternoon. Um, so if you know educators that are interested in um, this but wasn't a they weren't able to make it this morning, um, feel free to point them to our webinar page um, to join us this afternoon or evening if you're on the East Coast. Um, and uh, Cass, did we have any other announcements that we wanted to make at the end of this webinar? Um, I just, well, I, due to your uh, input, we will definitely plan a webinar for those Ozobot lessons. Um, I know a lot of people had questions about how people are doing that. Basically, teachers who brought their Ozobots home, they're doing lessons with their students online and then showing what the Ozobots are doing by live streaming it. So we'll get a little bit, uh, more on that and give advice and then if we didn't get to your questions um feel free to uh email us tweet us uh tweet kristen if you had a question for her she was all bright teacher i'll put it in the i don't actually know if i can put anything in the chat but we said it uh, to a few of you we responded with her twitter handle um it's also in the slides and then email gilbert um if you have any questions for him and again, we want to thank Kristen and Gilbert for taking the time this morning to share their expertise. Um, we were just so lucky to have them and for them um, to just share all the amazing things that they're doing and um, all the work that they've been doing with their students in their districts. So thank you both, Gilbert and Kristen. We really appreciate you taking the time with us this morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Good luck.
stay safe and healthy.